is Emma McCormick, and I'm the president of Praxis right now. And I would like to thank you all for coming out this evening. Before I introduce Dr. Hogan, I would like to remind anyone who has not paid their $10 dues that you can do that at the end of this uh, lecture. And also, there are, you might have noticed surveys on your chairs. If you can please take a minute to fill those out and leave them for us. That's helpful feedback for us, and it also helps us continue to receive grants to fund Praxis. At the end of the lecture, there will be about 10 minutes if you have any questions to ask. And now, I would like to introduce Thomas Hogan. He is Assistant Professor of Finance in the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University in Troy, Alabama. He was formerly the Chief Economist for the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. Dr. Hogan earned his Ph.D. in Economics from George Mason University and holds Bachelor's and Master's degrees in Business Administration from the University of Texas at Austin. His research interests include commercial banking, financial institutions, and monetary theory. His work has been published in academic journals such as Economic Inquiry, the Journal of Regulatory Economics, and the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking. Dr. Hogan was formerly Assistant Professor of Economics at West Texas A&M University. He has worked for Merrill Lynch's Commodity Trading Group and for investment funds in the U.S. and Europe. He has been a research fellow at the Cato Institute and the American Institute for Economic Research and is a formal consultant to the World Bank. Please help me welcome Dr. Hogan to Hillsdale College. Well, thank you, Emma, and thank you to the Praxis Group for bringing me in, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. I'll, I hope we'll have something uh, interesting that you can learn from this. Uh, I'm not going to be using the microphone, so I'll try to talk loud, and if like you can't hear me in the back, raise your hand or something, and I'll try to project a little bit more. Um, but I want to talk today about the gold standard, which I think is a sort of interesting but controversial topic. It seems like people have very strong opinions on it, no matter what side they're on, and some of those opinions are well-grounded and some of them kind of are not. And so it seems it's, it's one of these weird issues that a lot of people you know, think they have some idea about it, but don't really know it as well as they should. So I want to kind of talk about that today um, and think about the logic behind the gold standard, how it should work, some advantages and some disadvantages. Okay, I'm, I'm not like a hardcore gold standard advocate, um, but I do think that there are a lot of advantages to the gold standard that people aren't aware of or tend to undervalue. And so that's what I want to talk about is sort of the logical foundation, how it should work, and whether or not it does work in practice. And so I, I titled this talk, The Gold Standard History or Heresy. Maybe that's not perfectly uh, correct the way that I phrase it. Maybe it should be more like the success of the gold standard history or heresy, right? Because if you said, man, the gold standard, that worked pretty well, some people would say, yes, it's a historical fact. And other people would say, heretic, you don't know what you're talking about. That's crazy talk. How could you say such a thing? And so, you know, which is it? It's you know, maybe a little bit of both. We'll talk about it and you guys can decide. So first of all, a couple of sort of common perceptions that people would have about uh, the gold standard. Here are some quotes from a couple of different economists. The first one is from Paul Krugman, who claims that the gold standard um, had no price stability or, for that matter, any kind of stability, right? He's like, nothing good about the gold standard. No stability at all. A, a slightly more reasoned view uh, from Goolsby, who was formerly at the Council of Economic Advisors under Obama, says, the gold standard is volatile due to new gold reserve discoveries and changes in technology of extraction, right? And so he's saying, you know, it's a problem because there are these things that make it volatile. And so, you know, we don't want volatility. That seems like a bad thing. Um, but whether or not it's actually volatile, that's a testable proposition, right? That's something that we can look at and quantify and say, all right, is this really a problem or it's not? Uh, and so we'll look at that in a little while. Here's another quote. Um, from a professor from the University of Chicago, love of the gold standard implies macroeconomic illiteracy. <laughs> so that's pretty hardcore, right? He's like, people that are in favor of the gold standard are macroeconomically illiterate. Uh, I don't know, it seems like, you know, Alan Greenspan had some good things to say about the gold standard, and, and he was the maestro. Maybe people don't think as well about him now as they did back in the 1990s. But clearly, that guy knows something about macroeconomics. Right? He is not macroeconomically illiterate. 
Um, and so we're going to think about, like, these are some of the rather bold claims that would be criticisms of the gold standard, and we can see whether or not they actually make sense if we talk about how the gold standard works um, and how it's operated in, in history. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to first talk just a little bit about what we mean by the gold standard. Some people don't even know what that term means, um, and some people are kind of familiar with it but don't exactly know. And so I want to briefly talk about what the gold standard is, talk about how it should function in theory, and then use the example of the United States to talk about how did it actually work historically. Okay, I'm going to focus on the, the example of the United States because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, I'll, I'll have a couple of comments about you know, international experience, uh, but I just want to use that one because it's one that we know about and it's kind of easy to uh, test because we have some, some data from the history of the United States whereas we might not have data that goes back a lot further, and so I think it's a good example that we can look at. And then lastly, I want to look at some, some more reasonable criticisms. The quotes that I put up a second ago were you know, pretty bold and, and kind of very general statements, and I want to look at some more specific statements that were actually made by Ben Bernanke in a lecture that he gave and talk about whether those more reasonable criticisms are, um, are right or wrong when we're talking about so that's what I want to look at today, and I want to start off just talking about what do we mean by a gold standard? Okay, how do we define that? Basically, we have a gold standard when we're going to define the currency unit in terms of gold. So we can say, like, one, one dollar is however many ounces of gold, all right? Sometimes we call that the price of gold. I, I don't really like that because if it's a price, that implies that it's going to change. Right? Normally when we talk about a gold standard, we're thinking about the definition of the currency unit. Like a dollar is defined as one ounce of gold or half an ounce of gold or something like that, which, which is like you know, defining a measure. It's like, how long is a foot? Well, that's a defined amount, and we're not going to change the amount of the foot um, depending on what's going on in the economy. Prices change depending on what's going on in the economy, but in a gold standard, we're going to specifically define, like, this is what that currency is worth. Okay. Historically, back in the 1930s, uh, a dollar was worth a little bit less than a twentieth of uh, an ounce of gold. Right? 20, one ounce of gold was priced at $20.67. So one dollar was worth a little bit less than 5%, right? It's like 4.84 or something, something um, percent of an ounce of gold. And so that's what it meant to, to hold a dollar was it was interchangeable with some amount of gold. You know, I, if you want to get paid, you don't care if I pay you in ounces of gold or in dollars because they're the same. That's what a dollar means at that time, right? And so, um, so that's really what we're talking about for a gold standard is it's the standard. That is the definition of what that money means. And so that is really the defining characteristic. There are some other things that typically go along with this historically. When we're talking about gold standard, we're talking about when gold is actually the money that people are using. We could define a, a dollar as some amount of gold, and if people weren't trading with that, then who cares, right? We wouldn't be on a gold standard if people weren't using gold as the main currency. So if gold is money, and it's defined, um, and we have a gold definition of a dollar, then we're going to say, yeah, that's gold dollar, and we're on the gold standard. Um, we're typically going to talk about market production of gold. So I'll, I'll talk in a second about the different systems that we had in U.S. history, but basically what we want to think about is a commodity standard here, where the gold is being you know, dug up out of the ground and then transformed into coins and then used as money. Right? Um, for most of the history of the gold standard, there were lots of countries that were on the gold standard, and so they basically had fixed exchange rates between those countries because they were all using currencies that were defined in terms of gold. And so that meant that all their currencies had fixed exchange rates. Okay? That doesn't have to be true. It could be that just one country is on the gold standard and others are not. But for most of the period when countries were on the gold standard, there were lots of them doing it. Um, oh, and then the last one is, there are a lot of times multiple currencies going on. So you know, times when I would say we're on the gold standard, some people would say, yeah, but people are trading silver too. So it's really like a bimetallic standard. And that's true, but I want to effectively kind of treat those as, as the same thing. I'm going to talk about the gold standard as just any commodity standard. Because I want to talk about how it functions and, and mechanically how it works in terms of supply and demand.
So to me, it's not important for the for purposes of this lecture whether we're actually using gold and silver or we're just using gold. Okay. Um, so when we're when we're thinking about the gold standard historically for for a long time, um, people were trading gold and they were defining it in some terms terms of some kind of unit and. A lot of times we were defining it in terms of coins, right? It's easy to mint coins and then you know exactly how much gold and it's easier to trade coins because they're all the same weight, right? At least in theory they should be. I mean, that's the point of coining is that you take a chunk of gold and you put it into some defined weight and you put a stamp on it so that everyone knows this is one dollar or this is you know, one unit of currency, whatever that currency unit is. And so it's a method of standard, standardizing all the pieces of gold so that they can be traded and everyone knows what the official weight is. Now in the early years, the coins weren't very good. I mean, they basically, they weighed out some amount of gold and then they put a stamp on it. Like, that is the stamp that says, this is, this is one coin, one unit of currency, okay? Um, sometimes it was the government doing that. Sometimes it was private groups that were doing that. I mean, you can imagine uh, if you wanted to trade and you wanted to make it easy to trade with other people, you would, you would just want to have a standardized currency. So it's, there, historically there are lots of cases where private groups or banks or something were weighing the gold and then stamping it and making it into coins. Um, we don't really know if the first coins were made by governments or by private groups, but we know historically we've seen a lot of both of those groups. A lot of times governments would want to control the currency um, but sometimes it was people that just wanted to trade, right? Same thing in the United States. Uh, we had some gold that was minted and printed by the U.S. government, but some of it that was produced by private groups. Like when we had the California and Colorado gold rushes, um, they didn't want to take the time to send all that money to some U.S. government mint and wait for it to be turned into coins, so they had private groups that would just weigh it and stamp it and make coins out of it. And so we had the same thing in the United States. We don't have to look back to the start of time and think about like what were people doing 3,000 years ago. We can see that you know, we have the same thing in, in US history with sometimes private manufacturers and sometimes governments. Now, there's another aspect that we had in US history that was banking, um, where a lot of times we had private banknotes that were tradable for units of gold. Okay? And so for a lot of history, in fact, for the majority of the United States history, we had money that was produced by private banks, not money that was produced by the Fed and the government. And so, for most of history, it was banks creating the money, and they would just write you a piece of paper that says, you bring this in and we'll trade it for a piece of gold. Because like I said, that's how a piece of gold, a, a currency unit was defined. A dollar was some weight of gold. So they're like, we'll just give you a certificate that says, you bring this in and we'll redeem it and banks did that. When, in the early days of the Federal Reserve, once the United States had a central bank, they used to do that too. Okay, here's an early Federal Reserve note, and if you look carefully, you guys probably can't read this, but it says, $20 in gold coin payable uh, to the bearer on demand. So you used to be able to take that note and take it to the Treasury or the Fed or whoever and say, okay, I want to trade this for a piece of gold, and they give you the coin, right? Because they were worth the same thing. And so, uh, so the Fed adopted the habit of redeeming gold currency um, once they started issuing currency, but of course they eventually gave that up, and now we have fiat currency that's not redeemable for anything. It's only redeemable for other fiat currency. You can trade a 20 for 20 individual ones. Okay. So this, this system, when we, have, when we have free banking, this is like another layer of market mechanism on top of the gold standard. Gold standard, I said, in most cases we're talking about gold that's being produced by private miners, and so it's gonna fluctuate based on supply and demand, which I'll talk about in a second. But here you also have banks on top of that that are also replying, uh, responding to supply and demand because they can issue more or fewer banknotes, okay? And so, so there you really have two sets of, of market mechanisms going on. I'm not really gonna talk about free banking. You guys may have heard of that, may be familiar with it, but for the purposes of this talk, um, I, I just want to talk about how gold responds, gold production and consumption, okay? So thinking about the example of the United States, we basically had three periods in the United States 
that correspond to the three different general types of gold standards that you can have. The most basic one is a commodity-based currency, where you have private groups that are digging up the gold and deciding how much money they should be producing. Um, and then you have individuals that decide, okay, do we want to use this as actual money, or do we want to take the gold and use it for something? Right? It used to be that you could take that gold and you could turn it into jewelry, or you could take jewelry and turn it back into gold. Okay, so you had uh, demanders of currency deciding, what do we want to use this gold for? Do we want to use it for currency, or do we want to use it for some other purpose? Um, then, after the establishment of the Fed, the Fed for a little while was redeeming um, gold. And so for a little while, we had a central bank managed gold standard, where the Federal Reserve would redeem uh, dollars for gold, but they, they, they still managed the money supply, right? The Fed could still decide how much money they wanted to put in the economy. Um, and so in this case, we're kind of on the gold standard. It's like there's a constraint on the central bank, but the central bank is still making decisions about what they think should be going on in the economy, right? And famously, they made a very bad decision uh, in the early 1930s, and were a major cause of the, of the Great Depression because they didn't have enough gold and currency circulated in the economy. Banks started to fail. The Fed was supposed to bail them out, but didn't. And so a lot more banks failed and that led us into the Great Depression. At least that's the explanation given by Ben Bernanke and a lot of other economists. And so, um, so the Fed was supposed to be managing the gold supply, didn't do a very good job of it. Right? Um, but then after 1933, in the, in the midst of the Depression, they decided, okay, well, the Fed needs more power here to decide what they should be doing and how they should run the economy. They don't want to be constrained by the gold standard anymore. And so they ended that. Um, not the Fed themselves, it was actually done by executive order that all Americans were required to turn in their gold coins to the government and would instead, would in exchange for that, get U.S. government dollar bills, right? fiat currency. And so gold was no longer allowed in the United States. It could be traded internationally, or you could own just a little bit for jewelry, you know, earrings or something, or you could have gold collectible coins, but you couldn't own regular gold that could be uh, traded as coins. So after 1933, we went to a gold exchange standard where you could have international trade. In fact, we were on the Bretton Woods system for a while where lots of countries were all tying their uh, currencies to gold. So internationally, we were kind of on a gold standard at that time, but in the United States, you couldn't trade it. Right? And then after 1971, we left the Bretton Woods system and no longer any link to gold at all. Right? So we see these periods in US history correspond pretty closely to uh, the different types of gold standards that you could have and how involved the central bank Okay, so then how did the commodity system work under a gold standard? Um, so in this case, so I want to talk about the idea of the commodity standard and how it's supposed to work, right? Um, we can think about the commodity standard, I mean, it's, it's partly the production of gold in any single year, and so that's like a flow that's being produced and coming into the economy every single year. And so we have, we have producers of that, of that gold. They're going to be basically just miners. Um, and we have consumers. When we, when, we, when we say consumption in terms of flow, what we mean is gold that's destroyed. So if you use it to make computer parts and you can't get it back after that, there's no way to extract it because of, you, know, you used it in the production process. Or if you were to use it in people's teeth and then you don't extract it afterwards, you just bury them with the gold in their teeth that gold gets destroyed. So maybe small amounts, but it could be that we, we discover some big industrial use for gold and have to use a lot of it that destroys it. Okay? So that is the consumption. Um, but the supply, the commodity supply, uh, is important because it responds to prices. A lot of people don't understand that. People, I hear people say things like, well, the gold supply grows at 3% a year, and we're eventually going to run out of it. We're going to have dug it all up. I'm like, wait, what? That's not how markets work, you know? It's, there's gotta be some change in the price, right? I mean, if prices change, some people are gonna want to uh, mine more and some people are gonna mine less. In fact, we should think that the supply curve is probably gonna be sloping upwards because sometimes it's easy to mine gold and sometimes it's hard. 
any gold discovery, like any mine, is going to have some places where the gold's exposed, it's easy to get to, it's very cheap to take that out, but some of it's more expensive. It's really deeply buried, or it's in little tiny pieces, or you have to dig through the mud and then strain it through something. You know, it might be really difficult to get to. And so we can think of suppliers responding uh, to prices in the normal way that we would think about supply, right? A lot of people don't realize that. They're like, oh, you know, it's just uh, a function of probability when things are discovered. And then we get more gold, and other times we don't. Mm, I don't think so. I think if the price were high, people would be out there looking for it and trying to discover more. If the price is low, then they don't really care, right? So in terms of discovery and in production, we see producers responding. We, can, we also need to think about the gold stock because um, the price level is determined by the amount of monetary gold that we currently have. And so the stock of gold is how much gold we currently have that people are using for money versus the amount that they're using for other things like jewelry and plates and candlesticks. Right? And so if you uh, have a big increase in economic activity, you need more money, um, that, that's going to make the gold more valuable, and so people are going to want more of it. Uh, you're going to need more of it for transactions. But if you have, um, in terms of supply, if you have gold that's like not very valuable, people use it for jewelry. If it is very valuable, suddenly they're like, mm, I'm going to take my candlesticks and this gold necklace and turn them into money and use it to buy some stuff. Right? And so in that sense, we have gold production in terms of supply and demand. That is like the flow that's coming into the economy every single period. And then we have the stock of gold um, that is really going to be the thing determining the price level. Okay? So I, this, this, um, I've taken this example actually from the textbook of Larry White, who's a professor at George Mason University. His book, The Theory of Mon Monetary Institutions, goes through this in detail. Um, I'm just going to go through like a quick example because explaining the, it, the supply and demand like I've already done, I mean, I think that's the important part. If you guys are interested in economics, then you know basically how markets work already. And understanding that the supply of gold and the demand for monetary gold are both functions, not something that's like a fixed thing, that's the most important part. But I'll run through a quick example here of um, if we have a demand shock. Uh, so the prices in these markets have to be equal, otherwise we're not in equilibrium, right? If the, if the price in the stock market goes up and stock market, stock and monetary gold goes up, um, then that means the miners are going to see, okay, gold is more valuable, let's produce more of it. And so what will happen then? Let's say, let's say that there's a demand shock here where suddenly we have a great year in the economy, people want to spend more money, but they can't because they need more gold to do that, right? So suddenly they want a lot more gold, and oh, I'm not lying, so suddenly we have an increase in the demand for gold. So of course, what that's going to do is drive up the price level, right? And so when it drives up the price, on the, the production side, the suppliers are going to see, okay, so that is going to be a higher price level where we're out of equilibrium in the production market. So suddenly it's going to push it up. The, the price level now, we have a higher quantity supply than quantity demanded. So we have a temporary period of overproduction here where they're producing more than they normally would at equilibrium, right? But if we have overproduction in the flow, that's going to mean a lot more stock is going to be created. And so that's going to shift the supply in the stock. And of course, that brings down the price and brings us back to equilibrium in the flow. Right? And so we see this movement where we have a shock in the um, market, in, this, in the stock of gold, and we get a response in the terms of production that brings us basically back to the price level we were at before. Okay? That's important because one of the biggest criticisms of the gold standard is Prices are not stable. You can have these big shocks, and it's going to cause a lot of volatility in the economy. Right? Normally, people are not as worried about the demand side. Um, if you look back to the 1930s, people were really worried about the demand. They were like, demand is going to outstrip the supply of gold, and we're just not going to have enough gold. And that seems weird, right? It seems like from this simple example that producers are going to respond. The bigger one these days that people talk about is they say, what if you have a big gold discovery? Well. Okay, so if you have a big gold discovery, then yeah, that's going to affect it, but you know, supply and demand, right? We're going to see if we, have, if we have too much for a little while, then that's going to change the stock, and eventually we're going to come back into equilibrium. 
right? That was the Goolsby example that he's like, we're going to have a stock and that's going to shock the system. Um, maybe that's a problem. It could be in theory, right? It could be that it drives us out of equilibrium and the production, the, the flow, just takes a really long time to catch up with the amount of gold that people need, right? It could be that it, it causes a big disruption in the economy, but maybe not. Maybe gold suppliers respond really quickly. That's an empirical question that we want to ask here, right? And so we can think about all the different examples of how you can have uh, uh, shock to supplier demand uh, in the stock. You can have an increase or a decrease. In both of those cases, you're going to get a response from production and go to the original price level. Okay? We can also think about shocks to the flow um, where there's a new technology that makes gold mining easier or there's a new technology that consumes gold. Both of those things are going to cause permanent changes in the price level. So there could be some volatility there too, right? But we'd have to look and see, okay, how big are these things empirically? Do they cause major, major disruptions in the price level? Here's a chart of the price level in the United States during the period of the gold standard from 1792 to 1913. Um, I wrote 100% up there, what I meant is like, that's one, if you think about an index, we start at that level and just see if it goes up or down. Well, 200 means twice as, uh, twice as high um, as it was at, at the start in, 19, in 1792, right? So there are a couple different things that we see here. One is that we see that over that 122 year period, uh, the price level was flat over the whole period, but it was volatile in the middle, right? We see some, a little bit of jaggedness in the individual years, but we also see those two giant peaks. Right? And so, so in some sense, they're right. The people that are saying, well, there, there are big uh, volatile events that happen under the gold standard. Okay, that's true. Um, what caused these events, right? The, the standard story is, well, California gold rush, right? 1849, people discover all this, this gold for more than a decade. They're mining it out of the ground. And suddenly, there's all this new money in the economy, drives up prices. Right? And so that happens in basically the 1850s. You guys see the big spike in the 1850s because of that. Um, not exactly. This is the 1850s. No inflation at all at the national level. Right? I mean, there's inflation in California, but that's what's supposed to happen, right? All the new money's being earned in California. People spend it and it drives up prices there, but price specie flow mechanism, David Hume, when prices go up in California, stuff from the rest of the country looks really cheap. So you can buy things in New York, ship them out to California, money goes to the rest of the country, stuff comes into California, prices equilibrate. So at the national level, no major response um, in, uh, in the price level, right? And that was the California gold rush and also the Colorado gold rush, which was shorter, but uh, same, roughly the same time period 1858 to 1861, 62, okay? So those things apparently did not have a big influence on the price level. So what did? You guys know what these two big spikes are? You can take a guess. The second one appears to be the Civil War and the first one, maybe the War of 1812. Yes, events that happened in 1812 and 1861 were, in fact, wars. And in both of those cases, the U.S. actually went off the gold standard. We suspended the gold standard during the time of war. <laughs> because the government wanted to be able to spend more money, right? And so they said, all right, we're going to not redeem gold for a little while. In fact, during the Civil War, the government started issuing greenbacks. So they were printing their own currency, and they just said, we'll get you later. We'll, we'll make these redeemable after the war's over. Not exactly after the war's over. They actually waited until um, 1878 uh, to start redeeming greenbacks. But they eventually did. But by that time, the price level had already fallen back down, right? The economy had absorbed a lot of that price um, inflation that had happened and come back to sort of its natural level. And so we see here not volatility because of the gold standard. We see volatility when there's no gold standard, okay? And so these two big events, um, these I think are like, you, you could still say, but, th but that's, a, that's a problem with the gold standard, right? It's like we had to suspend it when there was a war and so, if you get the gold standard, you have to get these big spikes for wars too. Okay, that's true. But there were also two major wars under the Fed, the First World War and the Second World War, and they were basically equivalent 
in the economic disruption that the that so were the War of 1812 and the Civil War. Milton Friedman has a paper about this where he says they're all basically the same in terms of inflation and the, the economic disruption. And so if we if we look at this in a um, in the for the period of the entire United States, it looks a little bit different. So this is actually the log of the price level. I put it in log terms because you know that's something that we're going to do to adjust. Where if you take the log, you get the same shape but it just squeezes it down because the exponential growth here would be way off the chart. If I took the actual price level, it'd be so big that we couldn't even see these little, little squiggles at the bottom, right? And so we, we took the log and we see that, okay, there's a little bump in 1812, there's a bump in the Civil War, there's a bump here from World War I. World War II, there's a bump, but then it just keeps going up after that. Because after World War II, we get nothing but inflation. We get no more return to the old price level. It's just going up and up and up, never coming back down. In fact, the Fed's stated goal now is they want to have positive inflation all the time and never have deflation, right? And so um, on the gold standard, we got good deflation that when we were productive, when we had new technology that made, made it cheaper to produce stuff, prices went down because stuff was cheaper. Now we no longer have that. Prices go up all the time and mask those advances in technology that we might want to be able to see. Okay? So that's what happens uh, with the different periods under the, under the um, gold standard. And then during the Fed, you see uh, a little bit of volatility, but mostly just going up after that. If we look at GDP growth during these two periods, we see that it was mostly higher during the gold standard. So this is a graph that is um, the, it's actually the centered moving average of about, I think it was seven or 11 years. And this is from a paper that I wrote that was published in the Journal of Macroeconomics comparing the Fed and the pre-Fed uh, economies. And so this, what we're looking at here is GDP growth. Um, and the five, you know, we're getting like four and a half percent roughly for the Fed. And then with the Fed, first we have in the early Fed years, the Great Depression, then we have a big spike during World War II, and then we have a little bit lower average growth after that. So if we wanted to compare what's going on in, in the economies uh, during these different periods, we can look at sort of four things that are rough estimates of how the Fed might be doing. The rate of inflation, the volatility of inflation, the rate of GDP growth, and the volatility of GDP growth. Now I want to look at the difference here between the pre-Fed period and the post-World War II period, because that's sort of the standard. When people compare the Fed to the gold standard, we say, yeah, the Fed caused the Great Depression, but we're going to leave that out. They were early. They didn't know what they were doing. We've got to figure it figured out now, so we'll leave out the Great Depression. We'll leave out World War II also because, you know, it was volatile, and so we'll only look at the post-war period when things have calmed down. So here's the difference between the pre-Fed and post-war period. The rate of inflation was 3.5% lower on average in, before the Fed. Okay? Volatility was higher before the Fed. Volatility of inflation. So it was, there were some movements, right? Part of that we saw was caused by wars. Um, growth rate of GDP higher before the Fed. And volatility of GDP also higher. Okay. So in some sense, the people that are saying, well, there was more volatility before the Fed, they're kind of right. If we look at these differences, they are statistically significant. So green, uh, the growth rates of inflation, having lower inflation is probably better, having higher GDP growth probably better, but higher rates of volatility and inflation and GDP growth, those are probably bad, right? And so that's what happens if you compare the pre-Fed period just to the post-war. I think a lot of economists would agree with you know, some of them, like I put up earlier, were making claims that there's no stability and it's crazy and it's terrible and the gold standard, you know, you're illiterate if you think anything good about it. Um, most economists probably wouldn't say that. I think they would say basically this, that yeah, GDP growth was a little bit better, inflation was a little bit lower, but there was more volatility. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's true. Uh, if we said... GDP growth, some, some people would say, yeah, but that's because of the um, industrial revolution that happened, and so you know, maybe that doesn't really count. Maybe. Could be endogenous, right? It could be that the good money supply, stable money, caused the industrial revolution to be better. It could be that if we had stable money for the last 20, 30 years in the United States, that the information revolution maybe would have been twice as good. So we don't know. You know, the criticism that, 
well, it was just this one unusual event, industrial revolution. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, it's not obvious. But I wanna take this and break it into slightly smaller scale that I think we can maybe make a slightly better comparison. So, um, I wanna compare the uh, state and national banking system. So let's say the state banking system before the Civil War, at that time banks were regulated at the state level. Um, and it was a little bit unusual, it's hard to tell whether that's good or not. We had a lot of free entry, and so some people refer to that as the free banking period. Although at the same time, we had a lot of state level regulation on branch banking, where banks weren't allowed to branch into other states. Sometimes they weren't allowed to have more than one single location, which we would call unit banking. So they were still regulated. Um, and then we also had, during that period, the first and second banks in the United States, which were national banks issuing money, but they weren't central banks because they didn't control the money supply. But they may have caused some disruption. Um, during the national banking period, after the Civil War, what happened was the US government wanted to standardize uh, bank regulation at the national level, so they essentially forced any bank that wanted to issue currency to convert to a national charter. And so at that time, it's a little bit more standardized, and it's a little bit more like what people would consider the classical gold standard because you had banks that were all similar, holding gold, redeeming it, and international trade um, that was pretty standard. I also, I, I wrote up here, compare these to the post-war period. What I actually want to do is I want to compare them to the years before the Great Moderation. So the Great Moderation, if you guys aren't familiar with this, in the mid-1980s, the US economy suddenly got a lot more stable. And a lot of people attribute that to monetary policy. Um, some people don't. There are papers from the, Pet, the, the Federal Reserve that say, okay, so we did have good monetary policy, but we also had a period where there were very few supply shocks. And so it may have just been a lucky couple of decades where not a lot of stuff happened relative to the periods where we had all these wars. Um, it may have been that companies got a lot better at managing their stocks because like Walmart has all this new technology where instead of having a big warehouse full of stuff, they have stuff delivered every single day and know exactly what they need. So they have better inventory management that kind of minimizes the damage from recessions. At least that's what, that's um, one of the papers from the Fed says, you know, it may not have been monetary policy that caused the great moderation. Anyway, the point is, even if we say the Fed got better after 84, is that generalizable? What about the period from, the, from after World War II up to uh, the great moderation? <coughs> Let's compare to that. So if we compare that, what we see is, again, in terms of inflation, pre-Fed period is clearly lower. In fact, the national banking period is really low because it starts at that peak after the Civil War. And so it's really like a little bit, uh, it, it's actually a negative 1% average. Um, that might be bad, it might be good. Some people argue that that was a period of big productivity where prices should have been falling because it was, made, it was becoming cheaper to produce things. So low inflation during those periods, higher volatility of inflation during the state banking period, but the national banking system was actually less volatile than the, the early years in the, the post-war period before the Great Moderation. Okay? Um, it's a little bit more volatile than, than the Great Moderation, but it's less volatile than the early post-war period. Rate of growth, still higher for the pre-Fed period. Um, volatility, almost, Zero. So state banking period, basically the same GDP volatility as after World War II, um, before the Great Moderation, the national banking period more volatile. So if we look at statistical significance, we this time see, um, again, rates for inflation and GDP growth better before the Fed. Volatility, well, compared to the early pre-Fed period before the Great Moderation, national banking better. GDP volatility, not different for the state banking period. So the point I'm trying to make here is like, I've kind of cut this a little bit into thinner slices. You know, maybe you can say, I, I guess it depends on what do we think is gonna be representative of the Fed? Is the great moderation, the Fed from now on, a lot of economists think it is. A lot of economists are like, we tamed the business cycle. At least that's what they said in 2007. <laughs> not quite as much anymore. Yeah, literally there's a paper from the Fed in 2007 that says, the Fed is responsible for the great moderation, and then things fall apart, and there's one in 2009 that says, the Fed is not responsible for the great moderation. <laughs> okay, well, either way. Um, but anyway, the point here is that, depending on where we look at, 
it might be that the it might be that the gold standard does even better on every one of these measures, and and it's just a few certain cases um, where it's not as good. Okay, so I'm not the only person to have written about this. Like I said, this paper was published in the Journal of Macroeconomics, so if you guys want to see it, it's available. Um, Christina Romer, who is the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama, wrote a famous paper in 1986 to say, is the stabilization of the post-war economy a figment of the data? She finds that it is. She, she says that basically the reason things look stable after World War II is because we're using the wrong numbers to measure the pre-Fed period. Our early measurements of what was happening before the Fed were estimates based on commodity prices, which everyone knows are more volatile than regular prices. And if you go back and adjust for that, it turns out things were no worse, maybe even better before the Fed. Another more recent paper, and I should say, Christina Romer actually has several papers on that same theme. Uh, another more recent paper by Joseph Davis finds no discernible differences in the frequency and duration of industrial cycles, so recessions, not any different between the Fed and pre-Fed period. Romer and Jeff Myron of Harvard actually have another paper on this as well, and they find that recessions were shorter in the pre-Fed period and no more severe. So it seems like I'm not the only one saying, you know, it wasn't so bad before the Fed. You got some pretty famous people that are, that are saying that too in top economics journals. Okay? So if that's the case, let's, let's think more about some of the specific criticisms of the Fed. So I want to run through quickly a couple of ones that came from Ben Bernanke. In 2012, he gave a short course at uh, uh, George Washington University, and one of the topics that he talked about was the gold standard. And so he had several criticisms of the gold standard. Uh, it can't be adjusted for economic shocks, medium run periods of inflation and deflation, frequent financial crises, shocks transmitted between countries, and subject to speculative attack. So I want to run through these just quickly and, and talk about them. This too, I actually have a paper um, that hasn't been published yet, it's still in review, um, but it's co-authored with Dan Smith and it's called uh, Central Banking Without Romance. The idea being people get romantic about the Fed and they don't want to look at the facts a lot of times. So they make some of these claims without doing real comparisons of, well, is this really better than what we have now? Because it could be that all these things are true, maybe it's bad, but it could be even worse with the Fed, right? So what do we compare it to? If we think about the first one, the quote from the, the, the gold standard cannot be adjusted to changing economic conditions. Well, yeah, that's because it changes on its own, right? I think Bernanke, Bernanke acknowledges that. It's like the gold standard's going to adjust, but what if it's not good at adjusting? Don't we need a central bank to come in and adjust it? Well, maybe, I mean, there are a couple of things about that. First of all, is that true? It may be, we know that the gold standard adjusts on its own, but the government was also interfering with the gold standard before we had a Fed. The uh, first and second banks of the United States intentionally created to mess with the money supply. There's some famous papers about Alexander Hamilton and how he wanted to manipulate the economy by issuing treasury bonds, and some say he was successful about that. And so, you know, the government has been trying to manipulate the economy even without a Fed. They're ju it's just not as easy for them to do. Right? But the bigger question is, compared to what? Right? Ben Bernanke seems to think that the Fed can adjust, adjust uh, the money supply in response to economic conditions, which seems to imply that the, the Fed is good at reducing business cycles. And we just saw a second ago, that's not necessarily true. Right? It's not necessarily more volatile before the Fed, and recessions weren't longer or more frequent. So what's the evidence that the Fed is actually better? It doesn't seem like there's any evidence for that, right? The, the, in some ways, the pre-Fed period was more stable and more productive than the Fed period, okay? What about the second one? Over the medium run, it causes inflation and deflation. Uh, okay, so maybe that's true, but like we saw before, it's mostly the wars when we went off the gold standard that we had some major inflation. We did have periods of deflation, but in some sense, it was productivity deflation, which is good, or it was recovering from a big inflation shock during the war. So maybe that's what we want, right? Maybe that's good that it has those. But again, compared to what, right? If it has medium run inflation, is that a problem? Doesn't the Fed have medium run inflation? The Fed has had nothing but inflation since World War II. So it seems weird to say that this is gonna be worse under the gold standard. It's clearly happening under the Fed, 
What about financial crises? Gold standard did not prevent frequent financial crises. Mm, okay, maybe it didn't, but that's not what was causing crises under the gold standard. Under the gold standard, it was at a time when banking was highly regulated and we didn't have interstate banking. So banks couldn't diversify. If you made a bunch of loans in, from your local bank into the economy, and there's some kind of shock in your town, some kind of recession that only affects your town, all the banks are gonna go out of business. This is really common because a lot of the banks lent to farmers. And so if there's some kind of weather event that causes a lot of people to lose their crop, the bank's gonna go under, right? On the other hand, there were mechanisms to help minimize the damage caused by those shocks. Banks were getting together to form banking associations where they would bail each other out if they were having problems and they were members of clearing houses that would also bail them out if they were having problems. So there were at least some mechanisms that were there to help prevent these shocks. But again, compared to what? The Fed caused the Great Depression. The Fed at least partly caused the, the recent financial crisis. So is the gold standard really worse than that? It seems weird to say that the crises were worse under the gold standard. Um, by some measures, crises have been more frequent and more severe under the Fed. There are papers that, that say that since 1971, we've had more banking panics, uh, we've had more frequency in banking panics than we had before the Fed. So it seems like our problems of panics and crises are potentially more severe under the Fed than they were in the gold standard. International shocks. This is a, something that I talked about at the beginning where if you're on a gold standard, you're implicitly on fixed exchange rates. So it might be that a shock in one country transmits to other countries. We have a big recession, Europe's gonna have a recession too, right? Okay, but that's at least partly mitigated by price specie flow mechanism, like we talked about before. Gold is gonna flow between countries automatically because of market forces. So that's gonna alleviate some of the problems, but the problems compared to what? What happens when we look at business cycles between countries in the Fed period versus the pre-Fed period? It turns out we have more uh, international crises than we had before the Fed. It turns out we have more synchronized business cycles than we had before the Fed. So it, it, it might be right, maybe Bernanke's right, that under the gold standard they would spread between countries, but maybe it's even worse now under the Fed. Lastly, speculative attack. This one's a little bit weird because we normally think of speculation in economics as being a good thing. When people talk about like market speculators in oil, I'm like, yeah, they're driving it towards the right price. And so it seems weird that we would criticize that. Um, but compared to what? It might be, it could be that on a gold standard that there's gonna be speculation. Actually, I should say this first before I get into compared to what. I should say speculation on the gold standard isn't necessarily bad. Sometimes the gold standard would have to be revalued, especially in cases where you had gold and silver, both with a specific price promised by the government or named by the government, because over time those prices can change. You don't want the government picking a price and making a price control in the monetary system. But if they had to be revalued, that doesn't mean collapse of the monetary system, it just means there's a change. It could be that the, the, the collapse is so bad that we have to end the gold standard altogether and switch to a different monetary system. That didn't happen very much. Right? We would normally think of speculation as being something that's good, it's gonna push the market back to the proper price. But it's bad from a central banker's standpoint. Because they are trying to keep the price from going to equilibrium. So you can understand why Ben Bernanke wouldn't like that. But even if he doesn't, it might be something that's better for the economy if we have a revaluation. But compared to what? Okay, it turns out that speculative attack um, is more likely under a managed gold standard than a commodity. So if we have a gold standard, it's still better if the central bank is not involved. Okay, we might compare that to something more recent. If you wanted to look at the most recent exact example of speculative attacks, you would think of George Soros that forced the British government to revalue the pound in 1992. And I think almost every economist would say that was a good thing. Market prices were wrong, the government was trying to keep them wrong, and Soros forced him to revalue it to the proper price. In fact, I read a story about him where he said, you know, I knew I, was, I, knew I had it when they came out and announced, I can't remember the number here, but it was something like, we have, um, we have 10 million pounds that we have ready to def defend our exchange rate. And he was like, well, if I can take a 10 million pound position, I win. 
right? Because he knew he could force them to revalue it to the proper price. That's bad for the central bank. That's good for most of the people in the economy. So all these criticisms, I mean, I can understand what they're saying, but you have to think realistically, what do we compare it to? And you have to know something about the history of the gold standard and read some of these studies that make numerical comparisons and to figure out which one of those things is actually worse. Okay? What could we do instead? We might be able to do some monetary rules. I mean, gold standard's kind of a rule that restricts the central bank. That's the most feasible kind of reform that we could have right now. We might be able to just switch to a gold standard now. Gold standard was suspended by executive order. It's possible Trump could come on TV and just say, as of tomorrow, we are going back to the gold standard. You can redeem your dollars for gold. <coughs> if they did that at market prices, the US government would be able to support it. We would have about 30 to 40% gold reserve. And if you consider that about half of the US dollars are actually in other countries that are dollarized and using them abroad, maybe, this, maybe it's actually a much higher ratio. So it's possible that we could go back to the gold standard tomorrow. Um, but it's also possible that we could just allow competition in currency, allow people to use gold if they want to, allow them to use Bitcoin if they want to, and just see what happens. Maybe we'll get a gold standard, maybe we'll get something else, I don't really know, okay? So I think, in theory, it's possible that a gold standard's better, it's possible that the central bank is, is better, right? We don't really know, but if we look at the history of it, we can see that shocks were not bad and didn't cause a lot of disruption in the gold standard, um, and so in a lot of ways, the gold standard performed economically even better than the Fed. So I think a lot of the things that people say about the, the gold standard are just not based on rigorous analysis and, and thought about that. Um, and so it's good to think about, I mean, there are disadvantages of the gold standard too, but it's a lot better than people get a credit for it. So will we have some kind of reforms? I don't know. I hope you guys will have a better understanding of it now and it'll be up to you. Thank you very much for listening. So I think we can take some questions if you guys have any. I covered it all, right? <laughs> okay, if you guys, I should also say, if you guys think of anything else that you would like me to talk about in this, I'm probably gonna be giving this a similar talk at other universities. If you think I should talk more about the history or something like that, send me an email. If you want citations from any of the papers I talked about, send me an email and I can pass them along. Yeah, so um, I was curious as to why it is that you modeled uh, the market for gold, um, like natural gold, as um, perfectly competitive, whereas I would see that as having some barriers to entry because I personally have no idea where to start if I were to go out and start mining gold. Uh -huh. um, and would that have a potential effect on how quickly prices equilibrate? So I, I don't think I'm claiming it's perfectly competitive. I'm, I think it's like a regular market. I think probably there are some markets that there are bigger barriers than others. And I don't know, like right now, I, I'd say probably there are a lot of major players in the gold market, but that hasn't always been true. California Gold Rush is a bunch of individuals going out there doing their own thing. And I don't know, um, I don't know enough about technology in the gold market right now to say if it's easy for an individual to go out and start up their own thing. Um, I have heard of like single scientists that are trying to find better ways to discover where you can find gold deposits or how you can more easily refine it for cheaper ways. But you know, like a lot of people in the economy, they would come up with an idea and then sell it to someone else, some big company. Um, but I think it's just it's probably just like you know, a normal market. I don't think there are big barriers like there are to banking or some other industries where you see no entry at all. Um, but all that could change if we were to go back to a gold standard where suddenly there's a much bigger demand than there was before. I don't know. Doesn't the market for Bitcoin kind of this? So, so Bitcoin is a little bit different because the quantity for Bitcoin is regulated by the, the Bitcoin software. And so they can't produce anymore. But yeah, you're right. They do have miners that are producing more transactions. And so it doesn't have the it doesn't have the, exactly the same quantity um, property of having a change in the quantity. But it does have the property of adjusting to transactions. That's true. Definitive quantity. Yeah, define. Definitive quantity, which is the big difference between gold, which could be done in and maybe yeah. Porch, in, you know. in, in gold, you would have a change in quantity and a change in price, right? In Bitcoin, you don't have a change in quantity. People just transact at different
All I know about the Bretton Woods system is that it was something put in place after World War II, I think. Yep. What was it? Why was it created? So Basically. the Bretton Woods system was a uh, an agreement among um, a bunch of a lot of the major countries about what their exchange rates would be, and they fixed all those countries. Well, informally, I guess you would say fix them to gold. They the U.S. dollar was fixed to gold, and then those other countries fixed their prices to the U.S. dollar. So it was like a default international gold standard where everyone agreed we would have these fixed prices, and we can exchange it for gold and trade gold between countries if we. Um, and it was created after World War II by uh, Keynes and some other people that thought they were going to engineer the economy and um, were able to get a lot of international buy-in from, from countries that agreed to fix it. And um, by the 70s, but I guess the end of the 60s and the early 70s, a lot of countries decided it wasn't working and started to defect and then you know, the U.S. went off in the early 70s. And so there's some argument about from economists about you know was it a good system or not? In some sense, it was not because it fixed our exchange rates. In another sense, after we went off it, we got a lot more inflation domestically, and so perhaps it was a fair constraint on um, the Federal Reserve. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I hope you guys found this at least somewhat interesting. I, fi I find that a lot of people um, don't really know what the gold standard is, and some people that are out there talking about it, that are proponents of it, are sound kind of quackish and don't have good reasons to defend the gold standard. And so hopefully if you guys get into a discussion, you will have some reasonable knowledge that you can help impart to others and people will understand it better in the future. So thanks very much.